All right, good morning, everyone. I wanna welcome you to the first DSUA webinar of 2021. I'm your current president of DSUA, Jerry Hunt of LAWAST. Uh, for those of you that were with us last year and um, watched one of the DSUA webinars, this is essentially a continuation of what we did last year in which we're trying to prevent, present relevant information about the dry scrubbing industry. Um, and we're gonna continue doing monthly webinars in 2021, similar to 2020. Uh, again, for those of you that were with us last year and years past, you're familiar with DSUA. Anyone that's new, welcome. And just the quick background, DSUA is a nonprofit organization, and we've been around since 2008, promoting innovation, collaboration, and networking through all forms of dry scrubbing technology, whether it's spray dry absorbers or dry absorbent injection or circulating dry scrubbers, just um, trying to innovate and provide better solutions to the industry. Um, again, I want to thank everyone for uh, joining us today. Um, we have a new DSUA board, some carryover from last year and some new folks and a lot of folks were instrumental to help organizing and getting this together. So thank you to the board members and the advisors, uh, the, the sponsors as well, which uh, you'll hear more from them uh, throughout the webinar. We couldn't do it without the support of our sponsors as well. And thank you to our presenters that you're going to hear today. Again, we can't do this without relevant content. And uh, also a big thank you to Gecko Robotics. Uh, again, those who joined us last year, uh, you know, this was a new thing for DSUA. Uh, we've had to, we're always looking for improvement and this year we're doing a different platform and hopefully we'll have some more positive results and analytics. So we're trying something new here and uh, Gecko Robotics has been instrumental to helping us try to kind of work through this. So we appreciate your patience with any webinar there's always potentially some bugs or dogs barking or something. So uh, appreciate your patience as we kind of navigate through this stuff. So, but thank you again for joining us. So as far as today's agenda, what you're going to hear is uh, the first presentation is going to be from Michael Paul Jenkins of Gecko Robotics. His, the title of his presentation is Advanced Monitoring in Tight Windows. And it's a presentation about advanced monitoring using the robotic inspection technology. And followed from uh, following him, you're going to hear from Stuart Nicholson of Primex. And Stuart's going to be presenting about slurry atomization, anomaly detection, and spray dryer absorbers. So to start off, before we kick off, um, I wanted to, again, acknowledge some of our sponsors and give you guys a little bit of background on them. Because, again, we couldn't do it. We couldn't do it without them and, you know, without, uh, again, DSUA being a nonprofit organization, support from our sponsors helps us continue the effort year over year. So we wanted to recognize them and help connect anyone that maybe there's something relevant that you guys are going to find from this and you want to reach out to one of our sponsors. So uh, our first sponsor is LaWast North America. They're a subsidiary of the LaWast Group. Uh, it's a global, global company providing all calcium-based products, limestone, quick lime, a variety of hydrated lime, including uh, you know, their enhanced hydrated lime products, as well as other silica silicate minerals. Um, some of their high quality calcium products, such as the uh, enhanced hydrated lime, the Sorbical SP and SPS, they've been used in a multitude of dry scrubbing ap applications, primarily DSI, as well as circulating dry scrubbers. So, and uh, utilized for controlling acid gas emissions and utility applications, as well as a multitude of uh, industrial applications. So coupled with their products, obviously they have a, a team of flue gas treatment experts that, and um, value added equipment that you can kind of see here. So if it's something of interest, um, please reach out to Ian at LaWass. Here's his contact information. Um, Reaction Analytics Solutions, they were also a sponsor from last year and they're back supporting DSUA this year. Um, they specialize in engineer, developing engineering solutions through their computational fluid dynamic modeling. Um, the founder, Dr. Guisu Lu, he spent over two decades doing fuel combustion as well as uh, emission control applications. And as a result of his work and experience, he's developed over 100 CFD models to support um, you know, different engineering solutions. So whether you're looking for something in terms of front-end combustion or a back-end treatment solution, um, Guisu and Reaction Analytics Solutions can offer something through their CFD modeling, um, which incorporates also chemistry models. So that's been utilized to optimize, you know, the gas and gas contact with uh, chemicals and sorbents. So it's been recently utilized in DSI and activated carbon injection applications to 
optimize the process to maximize sorbent utilization with these CFD models. So again, uh, you know, Guisu's contact information is here. So if there's anything you'd like to learn more about, please don't hesitate to reach out to them. And uh, the last sponsor we want to acknowledge before we kind of kick things off officially is Primex. Uh, again, folks that you've been around DSUA, you've seen Primex uh, time and time again. There are folks that are providing comprehensive help to support whether you have a spray dryer or CDS or DSI. Uh, they're supporting those users to optimize their scrubbing performance. They've got over two decades of demonstrated customer success through, they've got a combination of um, knowledge, technology, as well as just overall patients to help navigate through custom solutions. So, uh, and again, if you were with us last year, um, you're familiar with Stuart uh, and he gave a presentation with uh, the dry fork station about a circulating dry scrubber. So if you haven't seen that yet, um, please go back and check it out and you'll kind of, you know, get a chance to see a little bit more about uh, what Primex is about and what they do for their customers. So um, at this time, I want to introduce <coughs> Mitch Lund. Mitch is our, going to be our moderator for the webinar. And um, <clears throat> excuse me, Mitch has also come on as kind of a DSUA advisor coordinating these webinars. So uh, again, Mitch has volunteered his time to help uh, support and put together these webinars. And he's been instrumental in helping get this together. So a big thank you to Mitch for uh, him volunteering his time to support DSUA. Um, Mitch is a chemical engineer from the University of Minnesota. And he spent his entire career uh, since he got out of college in the air pollution control industry. Mitch currently is a creator of his own venture, MLS or Mitch Lund Solutions, which he started back in 2018. So what MLS does is essentially assists their clients and uh, around the United States in optimizing and improving their DSI process equipment solutions. And this focus has been on equipment upgrades, retrofits, reliability improvements, as well as field testing services. When Mitch does have some free time, he does enjoy time with his wife as well as his uh, spoiled boxer, Miley. And uh, Mitch classifies himself as a lifelong Minnesota sports fan, which has only inflicted a lifetime of emotional anguish and mental trauma. So having said that, I'm gonna turn over to uh, Mitch to take over. So thank you, Mitch. I appreciate the introduction, Jerry. Um... Yeah, just, just excited to be part of the DS, DSUA um, advisory team this year. I uh, know a lot of the board members, been working with a lot of the uh, folks in this industry since my entire career. So just excited to, um, to be part of it and kind of, you know, help solve the latest problems in the industry. There's always something we got to solve, right? So um, always willing to support what, what this organization is always about. Um, before I introduce our first speaker, Michael Paul Jenkins over at Gecko. I am reminded by one of our panelists, uh, Samantha Link. Uh, the folks that are uh, watching, there's actually a Q and A um, feature at the bottom of your screen that you can use to send in questions. That uh, if you'd like to have them answered live, we will filter those out and get to them. Um, so make sure to use that if something pops up. We want this to be engaging, even though it's a little different with a webinar, but um, it, it'll be great. So just feel free to use that. Uh, without further ado, I will introduce our first speaker, um, who is Michael Paul Jenkins, also known as MPJ. Uh, he is the sales manager at Gecko Robotics. Um, as Jerry mentioned, they are a robotic inspection services company based out of uh, Pittsburgh, PA. Um, MPJ has worked in this space for about three years, uh, serving clients in both the power generation and pulp and paper industries primarily, among other industries. Um, MPJ is a native of Northeast Ohio, Youngstown, graduate of Walsh University, go Cavs, right, M right Michael Paul? Yeah, thanks for knowing that. <laughs> and uh, yeah, without further ado, why don't you go ahead and tell us if there's a better way to monitor or inspect scrubbers in between major outages. Can you do that for us? Yeah, I can go ahead and try. Uh, and thanks to, to Jerry, Mitch, and the, and the team for setting this up. And I also want to give a shout out to Sam, who's been very helpful with, uh, you know, setting up my help, helping me with the presentation and giving feedback and also organizing this. So with that being said, let's play everyone's favorite game. Can you see my screen? And I'm going to go ahead and shake. So what we're going to talk today about is advanced monitoring in tight windows. So 
in between major outages and going to talk a little bit more about uh, what happens currently, uh, what rapid ultrasonic gridding can do for you, and then also share a little bit of uh, case studies and, and talk a little bit more about the process of, of how we go about this. So again, what, what the viewers will learn, is, again, we'll go and talk about rapid ultrasonic gridding, uh, identify the advantages and disadvantages uh, of robotic inspection methods. Uh, and then, like I said, we're going to have uh, real world experiences of, of recent work. Uh, so first things first, we play a little game, a history, history lesson. If anyone knows the name of this car, I'll be impressed. Um, but ironically, it's a 1970 Toyota Corona. Uh, the reason why I have this up here is because I'm talking again about how we do things differently in a, in a pretty good uh, longstanding industry. So the 70s uh, played a pivotal role in the history of trade, shipping, manufacturing. Uh, in this decade, Toyota revolutionized the manufacturing world with the wide adoption of, of just-in-time or, or JIT uh, production. So in essence, that represents operating with low inventory levels where raw materials, goods, or even labor are scheduled to arrive uh, to be or be replenished exactly when or shortly before they are needed in production. H having this system, Toyota could solve some of the problems associated with keeping high inventory levels, uh, free a significant amount of capital, and reduce opportunity costs. Uh, it also could minimize storage, service, maintenance, and inventory risk costs. So you're probably asking yourself, what does JIT Toyota uh, have to do with dry scrubbers or, or the power industry? And that's a fair question. Um, so to highlight again what just in time or JIT is about in the transportation industry, uh, what they identified was overproduction, uh, waste associated with inventory, waste associated with time on, on waiting, transportation, uh, more time on identifying issues, as well as waste associated with inspective items. So we all know Toyota today, uh, it's one of the world's largest uh, auto manufacturers, but in the 70s, um, it wasn't, right? So it was still a foreign car company similar to Honda. Um, so when we look over to the power generation side, uh, forced outages can be kind of associated with overproduction, tied up resources, contractors waiting on contractors, uh, hectic outages, scaffolding, uh, Gantt charts. I've seen some of you guys' Gantt charts and I, I, I applaud you for doing that. Uh, and, and then always, obviously there's some errors that are associated with um, outages in general. So with the problem of you know, the, the outage schedule and the dry scrubbers that we've known, we know about the failures, right? Whether it's general thinning, localized corrosion, um, but the localized corrosion is not always uniform, so it's tough to predict and find. Uh, erosion as well, you know, rapid deterioration and, and loss of life expectancy. We're talking about massive search areas. Uh, thankfully, you know, user groups like DSUA or, or, you know, LinkedIn or other forums, you know, help share that information uh, and help identify those for, you know, shared knowledge. Uh, but one of the issues now is what do you do in between, right? There was a time where major outages, outages were every other year. Uh, now you're looking at every three years or even some every six years. Uh, but what about those maintenance outages, those tune-up outages, those winterization outages if you're up north or those summerization outages if you're down south? Um, as well as collecting that data uh, and those corrosion rates that are, again, above what the, the predictions were. So let's talk about a little bit about what happens today, whether it's cleaning, scaffolding, rope access, there's spot checks in between. Um, you have to ask yourself what kind of cleaning process you're gonna do, whether it be water washing, deck cord, grit blasting. Um, everyone knows scaffolding a, a round object is not the easiest thing to do. Uh, and as you can see some of these pictures, I was when I was going through the old presentations, I wanted to highlight some of the innovation that was highlighted years ago. Uh, and as you can see, one of those was rope access. You know, those are braver men than I than I would do, men and women. Um, but it, it obviously reduces the need for excess scaffolding, and it's a great resource to have someone to go down there and get eyes, hands on, be able to give a report back. Uh, but one of the downsides with that is is repeatability, right? You might be able to get a generalized area, but how do you how do you get back and check that and delta map that year for year? So for for that reporting inspections, uh, this is, is uh, one of those resources I was referring to whether it's the CAMS on an SDA, you'll typically get a, a, a report uh, back that looks something like this. Now, again, this is a great resource to have. Uh, you have that information, you understand what's going on. But as you can see, uh, this is one of 32 pages. 
So when you take around all these readings and, and you multiply it across 32 pages, you're talking about roughly 6,000 data points. Really nice to have, absolutely. Uh, but if there was a, a different way to do go about it, you know, maybe we should, should visit that. What that is, is really it's ultrasonic gridding. So, you know, here's a, another a great example of our dear friend Klein over, at, uh, over in Nebraska sharing this with us. Uh, as you can see, similar to that uh, report earlier, uh, you see the low readings, whether it be the 213s here. And, and on the left, I have a little comparison to Battleship, not just because I find myself locked in my house for the last nine months, in board games is obviously great, but it kind of got me thinking that ultrasonic gridding is similar to, to Battleship, right? You're looking for certain, for certain targets, uh, you're looking for the the sub, the destroyer, the aircraft carrier, similar to the corrosions that we've seen uh, throughout the years past. Well, let's talk about rapid ultrasonic gridding. Uh, going off of that battleship theme, uh, shout out to the USS Iowa and their 16-inch guns on the left. If anyone was on that ship, uh, that, that's pretty awesome. And going back to that left, uh, that the previous slide to this one, you can kind of see the difference what that rapid ultrasonic gridding could take. Now, I don't have the time frame on, on that uh, rope access inspection report, but it's good to say it was probably over the course of a couple shifts, right? Uh, on the right here, you have an example of one of our heat maps, one I'm gonna show you in a few slides, how you can interact with it. This is the Excel version. So if you are to use an Excel program or use a product like Aware, uh, where CSV files can easily upload, this gives you that ability to use this data in a uh, platform that you're already familiar with. I'm going to show you a quick real video real quick, just to kind of highlight of this. Uh, so we already identified some of the problems, whether it be over time, multiple uh, shifts, a lot of crew members, several crew members, uh, you know, the cost of scaffolding we've already talked about as well. Um, and then again, that low density of data, not to mention the time associated with these outages. So the rapid ultrasonic gridding is something that Gecko does, but it's an industry standard as well. So it's that inspection method that provides fast and flexible as well as full coverage, um, or most of the time full coverage on those most critical assets. Uh, so whether it be one shift, uh, a cone on a drop, you know, one robot, it comes with two people. Uh, so depending on the setup as well, there could be little to no scaffolding as well. And you honestly are getting thousand times, if not a lot more data. As you can see in that previous uh, video slide, we have robots that have up to 128 transducers. It gives you a quarter inch data density, which is similar to what you would want to do on a tank floor, but it's also something that you can do on, on dry scrubbers as well. And this kind of highlights some of the time that's associated with some of these inspections, as well as the speed that you can see in this video. We have a great marketing team. Again, that shout out to Sam for taking some of these great video shots. Pop out of this real quick. All right, I knew it would have some issue. There it is, cool, back at it. So, so like I, other ultrasonic testing methods, RUG captures raw A scan data, which can be presented in a B scan or a C scan. And for those who aren't familiar, think of an A scan as a measurement or an EKG. It's giving you a sound amplitude and you're gonna see you know, what that thickness measure is. Now that B scan is a bunch of A scans lined up off of a run. And then a C scan is what the robot's presenting right here on the right. It's the, the, the data that you can see interact with. Uh, so like I said before, four to 100 UT probes can run simultaneously. It captures that raw A scan data. Uh, and such as such, the speed of the coverage is greatly increased over methods used like utilizing a single thickness probe. So the spacing of that probe and the frequency of recording varies depending on the amount of thickness needed. So if you're looking for something small like pits or, or generalized corrosion, that's something that can ultimately help identify these things based on the density that you need. So the robot's cool, but as someone who started with Gecko in the operations department, I like to highlight the fine work that they do. So not only are all the inspectors ASNT level two, uh, but they have their eyes on and, and reading from the start of the finish, calibrating before the inspection, after the inspection. You know, what we hang our hat on is the quality of the data. So one of the things that we can do to help identify this inspection sooner is what we have called BOFI. And basically it's a Wi-Fi system that is deployed. So it automatically validates and also uploads to our teams, both in Houston and Pittsburgh, 
uh, as long as there's good internet access. So uh, obviously that comes with the territory that you're working with. So at launch, they're uploading that data. And again, it's getting quick turnaround. So whether you need it in a quick time, say 24 hours, we can do that. And we can even give you a good 85% confidence of that delivered product you know, after half a shift. Uh, because this is also recorded, you have the ability to audit and revisit data down the road. For example, if you're looking for a unique, unique damage characteristic like under deposit corrosion, uh, you can you look at these A scans and it really starts to paint a picture. So all these A scans as well are go through our algorithms, but also have eyes on with our ASNT, ASNT level threes. So we have three on staff that help write our procedures and help make sure that the product is good. This is actually one of our original scrubber inspections. Um, and as you can see, one robot on, uh, on this scrubber, three people involved, just a laptop. So you know, there's not a lot of slips and trips and falls minimal equipment, and as you can see, we're operating outside in the outlet. So let's talk about those advantages, right? So delta mapping drops is a big one. We know the areas of concern with certain scrubbers, right? Whether it's the spray zone or you know cones or anything like that. Um, we can travel a foot a second, so it's, it's very fast, as opposed to other robotic applications like AUT, uh, which we'll highlight in a little bit. Uh, and as you saw in the previous slide, dry scrubbers from the outlet ducts, the bag house, as long as it's carbon, we can adapt to that and, and inspect that. Uh, and it gives you that peace of mind knowing exactly what you have going on and being able to repeat that. And you're talking about one to 80 UT readings in a square inch. Uh, so in a typical a scrubber, we're talking about two to three million data points and it's comprehensive. You can work with it. Uh, and as you can see in that previous picture, there's less access needed. There are things to consider. When, whether it's cleaning, time, or access. Can I use water? And uh, will deck cord be enough? Uh, when was the last time I was in there? What's the current condition? When can we do this? Uh, can this inspection be capitalized? Or, or maybe, you know, I cannot fit it during the outage, but maybe I'll be offline for a few days at the end of the year. Things to consider when, when going after rapid ultrasonic gradient. For those of you who were involved with the dry scrubbers in 2019 in Kansas City, you might remember this 3D rendering. Um, because of the robots encoder, we can go back and retrace our footsteps year over year. So when, when we go into, we have a scan plan for every inspection that we, we go to. And so when, if we go to a certain area, we're hitting that area within millimeters. Again, when you highlight over one of these areas on, on the left, it'll bring up uh, the thickness, the picture, and if this is something that we've done year over year, you can start to get to this Delta map and understand what's going on. And because of because we keep every A scan of every inspection we've ever done, we're starting to get into predictability and understanding what could be coming down the road. To obviously help you guys plan, uh, whether it be uh, an outage two years down the road or in six months, knowing it is half the battle. So now we're gonna talk hey, about the funds. Hey, yes. MPJ, real quick, before you uh, go off, could you go back to the last slide real quick? Um, just wanted to confirm what I, I think I understood you say. So um, what it looks like is that little gray area on the left side in the center of um, that silo is what we're seeing a kind of a zoomed in perspective of thickness and the historical data. But it's it also takes a picture of that that particular region. So you could click anywhere on that silo and get all of this data, including a visual representation of what it looked like during the inspection. Yeah, absolutely. So not only is it taking UT thickness, but you're also getting that visual. Thanks for, for reminding me on that, Jerry. So yeah, you'll have I that picture. I just wanted to make sure that's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, it is something that we're working on to actually improve as well. So we have a whole engineering staff that is constantly working on making our process better. Uh, we're definitely not content. So you're going to get that picture. And again, that's not just going to be a UT measurement from one year. It's also going to be a visual. So as long as it's a clean surface, you'll be able to see exactly uh, what the condition looks like and get eyes on. Won't necessarily get hands on, but you have that data to back it up. All right, so the case studies, all the fun stuff, right? So uh, last year we inspected three B&W SDA shells. The, the, basically the scope was to get as much coverage as possible. Uh, so there was three vessels. It took about three robots, uh, six inspectors, and it took roughly six 12 hour shifts. And the end result was identified suspected areas of, of corrosion, uh, as well as that visual evidence as well. And in that particular uh, inspection, we took 10.3 million readings. 
this is a video I like to show all the time because it shows the abilities for that axis I was referring to. So with this, we're able to make that transition from the cone to the shell because of the actuators on the front end of the robot. And because of that encoder, again, it knows exactly when that moment goes up. So the other thing I wanna highlight is what the data looks like. So this was that previous uh, SDA that we inspected. As you can see, uh, there's definitely a, a spray zone area of concern. This is, this is widely known, uh, but there's also limitations to it, what we talked about cleaning earlier. Uh, as you can see, this, these white areas are, are just basically buildup that was just too aggressive to, to get off with, with traditional inspection, or excuse me, cleaning methods. Uh, but again, you're, you have an understanding of why that's there. And so what I wanna highlight real quick is what that looks like on our portal. So you can see again, here's the portal, but let's say you really, this is a lot of good information, uh, but you really wanna know about the bad areas. So the sliding bar gives you the ability to go back and, and really identify some of these lower areas. As Jerry pointed out, you can still see what's going on. So you know your elevation, you know your position, you know your thickness, you know what nominal is, and you also know the difference of nominal. Another one I want to highlight real quick is a, a CDS up in Wyoming, PRB burning uh, plant. Similar scope, maximum coverage of that shell and cone. Uh, there's only two inspectors and one robot, uh, and it took about three hours, three shifts to do. We understood that there was some suspected areas as well, and we were able to give them that, that visual evidence too. And on the drawings, uh, we didn't see this slip here, uh, but we had a feeling that it could be there. So we set the expectations that, hey, if there's scaffolders nearby, uh, you know, please let us know so we can get that set up. And, and that was ultimately what the plant decided to go with. And, and one of the things they mentioned, and this always comes up, is, is what that level of cleanliness needs to be. Uh, and as you can see, I took a little snippet of here. And, you know, that we set them expectations on how clean it needed to be. And it was probably dirtier than it should have been, but the guys worked around like professionals. I, I like to highlight that because again, coming from the inspection side of Gecko, uh, you know, it's a lot of hard work, but it's a lot of rewarding work as well, especially to get those kind of comments. Uh, so when we're talking about cleanliness again, you can see there's a light dusting over here. And while the robot does use water as a couplet, you might've seen that a few slides ago, asking yourself what that was. Uh, it, it does have the ability to clean some. And so when we're running up a structure and coming back down, we're continuously taking readings. So the water does get a lot of, uh, of uh, debris off. And on the right, here's what the robot looks like on the wall. You know, you can see these little holes. And we're talking about in this case, about a half inch spacing of, uh, of coverage. Here's what that SD, or excuse me, the CDS looked like as well. Um, as you can see on the bottom picture, uh, you can see the robot working amongst the scaffolding. You can still see the cle cleanliness that we're talking about. And something that I've seen a lot in, in these inspections, and for whatever reason, you know, the orientation or whatnot, but the north northeast side of these always look a lot different. So doing this type of comprehensive inspection gives you an understanding of why that could be, or at least uh, intuition on why that could be. What I wanna show you real quick, if you can still see my screen, is what that visual that Jerry highlighted as well. So as you can see, position 54, elevation six feet, you get that thickness, but you also understand here's those little bit of holes I maybe need to worry about. Similar to the SDA as well, you can highlight, scroll down, and really find these low areas of concern, right? Let's say you really wanna know about anything that's 100 mils or below, there you go. You type it in, you can also make your own some thresholds as well. There was about 1.3 million readings in this inspection. And this is some of the, uh, the cone as well for this inspection. So on the right, you can see what the cone looks like in its fixed form. And on the right, I made a little GIF to show you what you can see when you're working in with the portal. But this is some of the conditions that we were working in. You might be thinking to yourself whether you know, it's too dirty or not a good surface. Because we're taking so many readings, we're going to present the lowest reading that we can find. And because we validate everything, you're going to see what is actually going on in there. So other rug resources to consider, uh, there's obviously, you know, Gecko has a blog that highlights some of the capabilities, not just of Gecko, but of the industry, uh, as well as inspectioneering, which is an industry, inspection industry uh, resource. They're based out of Houston. I encourage you all to check it out, not just for you know, fixed equipment reliability, but inside an NDE, uh, as well as other technologies that might be useful 
whether it's in a scrubber or some other asset that you guys oversee. That being said, definitely looking forward to the future. Uh, if you those were here last year, we talked about the, the VR. Uh, as you can see, I'm having a great time over there. I had a couple of drinks, obviously. So it was a great time. Appreciate those guys setting it up. And on the right, uh, if you all remember, of course you remember Dave Kahn, he's now my boss. Uh, I'd like to share this because not only is it an impressive golf shot with one foot basically, but also he's highlighting when cargo shorts were cool and, and fun to wear. I want to go back to those times. I have tons of cargo shorts from my, from my college days. Uh, but again, free VR sessions, golf lessons by Dave, uh, and a location to be determined. So with that, uh, I'm open up to our questions and comments. Uh, thanks, MPJ. First, I know that uh, Dave shot there. That was like, he, that was like four putts by the time he took that picture. So he's not, uh, he's not. Full. He forgot to leave that part out. <laughs> um, the one thing I just want to add to you, you guys talked about the VR. Um, you know, I had a chance to personally experience that in Kansas City the last time DSUA was able to have an in-person conference. And um, unfortunately with these virtual webinars, we lose that ability to kind of demonstrate what that is. But um, I kind of wanted to share my experience because uh, um, what it entailed was, you know, wearing your VR goggles. And I recall it was as if I was inside a silo and all those, uh, the, the heat map of various thicknesses, as I kind of moved around, you could essentially see that different heat map as if I was inside the silo and um, I, I sure hope we can get in person and do this again, but um, I know I thought that was uh, an interesting way to pull all that data and put it into something that uh, we're, we tend to be a lot of hands-on folks. So it's kind of an innovative way to take new technology and, and still be able to represent it in something different. So um, yeah, I just wanted to kind of share that. Yeah, I'll definitely pass that feedback along to our engineers. I mean, these guys work around the clock and are very hungry and uh, being so close to Carnegie Mellon, we have the ability to get really bright engineers, uh, whether they be robotic software data. Uh, so I'll definitely, once we get out of here, I'll tell them that or share the video with them. I, I saw a question on here from uh, Kevin about the, the degree of pre-cleaning needed specified. And what I can provide on there is we have an example of the requirements that uh, Dave set up, Mr. Dave Kahn. And so we typically to reduce that scaffolding cost, we recommend a Whirlybird or a 3D lance that can get dropped down. This is something that we do a lot. And if you look at that inspection for that SDA, uh, you can see what that was. And this particular inspection only needed, it was only water that was in there and it took about 48 hours to clean. Now you do need decor in some cases, um, but we can definitely provide you uh, an example of, of cleaning that is required. But this is obviously an example of prior to cleaning and after. And, and there's another picture of Gecko. Um, so we can definitely set the expectations. And if you're comfortable, we can absolutely uh, introduce you or, or subcontract some of the preferred vendors that we have stationed throughout the country, uh, including internationally now. So uh, be more than happy to introduce you to them or, or at least set the expectations and, and make sure that you everyone's comfortable on the same page. MPJ, this is, uh, this is Mitch. First of all, I will tell you that fashion, unlike technology, is cyclical. So I think you can hold out hope for those cargo shorts potentially coming back. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, everything's coming back these days. So I had a question, just bigger picture. Obviously, one of the, the, the core objectives of the DSUA is to um, obviously communicate cutting edge technologies and, and approaches to problem solving to the industry. Uh, uh, robotics is obviously cert certainly part of that. And I think for um, maybe the younger engineers, uh, the students watching uh, me, uh, <laughs> the, the data that you are collecting and providing to your end users, how does that, what are they allowed to do that they otherwise wouldn't be able to do without it, if that makes sense? Yeah, well, so this is a question that comes up a lot is, you know, how much data do I need versus, you know, what is this data telling me? And so when I, I think it depends on the, the circumstance, you know, whether they're where they're going to use us, whether it be in that maintenance outage or, or, or the major outage, uh, but it allows them to just think ahead, uh, whether they need to do, a, you know, a skeleton or do a replacement of a, a, a course of the shell. Uh, I think it gives them the understanding of not only of replacing, but the type of liner that they need as well. 
I see Mary asked a, a question about liners and, and it gives them an idea of maybe the previous information that they have. And that's actually something I want to highlight is that we can upload previous inspection, uh, whether that be the, the example with the rope access or what Claude provided through the cams. And as long as that the positions are, are known, we can represent those positions on ours. So it'll give you the ability not only to think years ahead, but months or months down the road as well. So it'll help you understand what type of corrosion possibly as well, because when we keep those A scans, it represents certain characteristics, similar to like a, that EKG where you might see like a, a your heartbeat skip, right? That, that's telling you something that's going on. The A scan is going to do the same thing. And because we take so much, I can't explain, I can't express what a million data points look like. It paints a picture. Yeah, and, and certainly, I mean, when I saw those scans, I, I can just definitely see a next level um, ability when it comes to planning and, and making uh, decisions surrounding equipment. So pretty powerful stuff. Um, I think we got a couple more questions coming in here yeah. too. It's like um, Chuck is asking, what, what temperatures can the robot operate at? Can you answer that? Yeah, so we have um, multiple different robots, uh, typically for, for you know, what we're looking at for the scrubbers. A robot can handle temperatures up to about 160 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, we do have robots that actually have gold foil un underneath the drive uh, modules that can go up to 250 degrees. Uh, it probably can actually go a lot higher than that. But because we use water as a coupling, you know, obviously got to worry about evaporation. But for the most part, you're looking at anywhere from 160 to 250 once you get below freezing, the robot can still operate. But again, you're talking about the elements and, you know, freezing temperatures. So, you know, we have a job going on next week in, in New York that we're constantly monitoring the weather. Um, but we have ability to work around that, whether it's insulating the, the, the hoses or something like that. Um, Mary asked a question as well about resistant liners. So, again, having the, the resources to have having engineers on staff, we have programs that can tell us whether it's a, you know, ceramic liner or, or some type of stainless Again, if there's carbon on the backside, we, the, the robot has rare earth magnets that are basically 800 pounds of force. So when I was an inspector, we inspected a stack in Ohio that was a quarter inch Hastelloy liner with a quarter inch uh, carbon backing and the robot adhered to it. Now it did slip because there was air pockets in. So we knew that there was, it was not tightly adhered. So if something did happen like that, the operators write that down in the inspection report. So it understands why there was a missed spot there. So is there, I guess, does that mean that depending on the, the nature of the liner in terms of maybe even, is there, I guess, is there a limitation to the thickness of the liner or is that just understanding that information maybe dictate which robot you guys yeah. bring in? So we have another robot that does magnetic induction. Other people might know it as uh, magnetic liftoff. And that is, if you wanted to tell just the thickness of the liner, as long as it's non-ferrous, uh, we can work up to 70 mils. So anything above 70 mils becomes an issue. But if you're having you know, a, a thin liner or like Inconel or something like that, and you wanted to monitor that process, that would be a great resource for just the liner. A UT is gonna tell you overall thickness. Uh, and so, Depending on the type of liner, you know, that information is, is, is definitely needed to, in order to give you an inspection uh, proposal or actually do the inspection. And, and we're definitely not going to set Gecko up for failure or, or set up the utility for failure. So if, if we're not comfortable with doing an inspection, uh, we're, we're not going to do it. And we're going to tell you why. Maybe there's a way that we can work together to, to find uh, an area of concern and work with you. But there are definitely some uh, some issues that come up and I think it's on a case by case basis for sure. And uh, for the folks that submitted those questions, if, uh, if you got any follow-up questions or uh, we didn't fully answer, feel free just to kick another, uh, another question through or follow up with us afterwards. Um, we do have another one from the audience here. And the question is from, uh, it's a, submitted anonymously, but uh, can the users download the deliverables, the data that you guys get from the portal, or is it something you can work with them virtually. So ultimately, as, as far as the data and information you collect, what are, what are your deliverables like and what, what can an end user expect from an inspection in terms of what they receive from you guys? Yeah, so they're going to get obviously, you know, the, the portal inspection, the Boca plot, like we call it, it's going to tell you the elevations. Um, we have some customers that prefer Excel, what we highlighted earlier. So when you're in this portal, you can download that uh, Excel report. 
which is the demo, so you won't let you. Uh, but it will download and it gives you, similar to this um, inspection up here, uh, be able to download that Excel file and it's gonna tell you the same coordinates. It's basically a reflection of the online portal. So when you're using your own inspection uh, software or your own asset management integrity software, again, this it is available to download and it's able to be adjusted to what you need, color thresholds, uh, you know, looking at the A scans. We had one customer that SDA that we originally were plotting in a foot by foot uh, Boca and they were looking for more of, of a pitting type of, of corrosion. So we, we got that down to six inch by six inch now, when I say six inch by six inch, the robot is collecting a much of data on the way up and way down. Uh, but if there's not a good A scan, you might have, when you get to smaller density, you might have a little bit more of misses. But again, you can download that data rather quickly. Okay. So you guys can, it sounds like to some degree, you can kind of customize depending on what the preferred means of deliverables are. But essentially, they can get all the raw data to review and manipulate and you guys provide some form of summary or representation so that again, whether it's a heat map or something visual, you know, they can, they can have a summary as well as access to the raw data. If I've got yeah, all that right. 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 You have that access. It, it's summarized. You actually have an inspection report as well. You have the understanding of, of the metrics taken, the average thickness, the, the number of readings selected as well. So very customizable from the inspection process from the follow-up process, anything, you know, we're on call. We have some of the, the brightest minds, young minds uh, that can definitely uh, make it different for every customer or every user within that utility as well. If your utility still has, you know, NDE professionals, guys and girls that know the, the ACNs, we are, we are transparent uh, with that process and we can help explain why this reading is there. Because again, you might take your own D-meter up, you can't find it, um, but the A-scan is gonna tell you exactly what's going on and show you again where that is. Okay. Hey, Jerry, this is Stuart. Uh, can, I, can I ask a question? Absolutely. Uh, Michael Ball, um, thanks for this. Uh, lots of good information. Um, on, this, on the slide that we're on, the image that we're looking at here, I think you mentioned during your presentation that you noticed that the corrosion rates seem to be higher in one quadrant or region of the vessel. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the Northeast. Could, could you elaborate on that a little bit? Um, are you talking about just the, 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 at this one facility or in general? Um, just, just tell us a little bit more about what you've discovered here. Yeah, so uh, it's, not just, it's not just these uh, dry scrubbers. It, it's, it's uniform even uh, in, in tanks, at paper mills, refineries. Whether it's the you know, erosion from wind coming from the west or the sun coming up, we see this over and over again on this fixed equipment. Uh, just recently, last week, I had a customer reach out to me uh, from the southwest with the scrubber, and we were looking over their inspections. This, they do something similar where in their maintenance outage, they get what they can get. And you can see that the north, the northeast side, for whatever reason, whether it's how the flue gas comes in, again, I don't always have that information or, uh, available, but something about this is, is, is something is affecting the northeast side. Uh, and if you're only able to access the, 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 the west or the south, you know, you're not seeing the full picture here. So when you're, when you're going in this inspection, I mean, you go down on the, you just map, map it out and you can start to see it's really affecting a certain area. And on the right, this is actually the continuation of the north as well. So uh, I'd love to know that answer. If someone has a theory or, or, or experienced something similar, uh, I think that's a great time to talk about that uh, or you know, have a follow-up conversation regarding that. But it's something that I've seen three times in the last 11 days, actually. MPJ, we got one more from, coming in from Todd uh, asking if Gecko has had any experience with this process in cement. Can you take that one? Uh, cement as in? Cement industry. Oh yeah, so uh, we have worked with a few customers in the cement industry. Uh, I believe if you consider Lawas in that industry. Uh, my previous life, I worked with Lafarge uh, Wholesome, uh, but I, I'm not 100% sure uh, on that, but I can find out. Uh, let me see, who asked that question? Todd, Todd filed in, yes. Uh, I will write that down and see. I know we've had conversations with them. Um, I've actually had conversations with 
uh, CMEX as well, um, but not regarding uh, any scrubbers. But yeah, if, if any industry for that matter, I mean, airline industries with their tanks, uh, cement, paper, if it's carbon and it's uh, proposed to uh, corrosion or erosion, we'll inspect it for you. I was going to say Help that was out. my follow up for you was, are there any uh, industries that you can apply this technology to? But it sounds like you answered that. Yeah. Yeah, and the, the one thing I also want to point out is we talked about the robotic side of Gecko. I highlighted the ISNT level threes. We have about 60 operators, uh, both from the industry and both who are organic and grew up with Gecko. And so anything that we cannot do robotically, but we can most definitely do manually or traditionally. So checking welds with phase array or, or shear wave, uh, eddy current, things like this, we have that ability. A lot of our guys are, are who are prone to that are down in Houston, but we actually have 10 guys down there from um, our Pittsburgh office in Houston training right now too. So it, it, we're coming more and more of an NDE company. Real cool. Um, well, one question that kind of triggered my thought because, uh, you know, again, thinking through cement, you know, I, I know that, you know, there's a lot of gas conditioning towers where, you know, I could, I can see this inspection. Um, and it made me trigger a thought that, uh, what about like, you know, you guys are showing tanks and vessels. Have you guys done any, uh, use this technology, like in bag houses, whether it's in the hoppers or just any kind of inspection to see, uh, inspect wall thickness and get data in, in a bag house. Yeah. So, um, off the top of my head, I'm pretty sure we've inspected bag houses. Uh, the, the, the limitations of the robot is obviously it needs to be some type of carbon uh, to adhere to. But the, really the only other uh, limitation is how much space is being able to move. So the robot's about seven, seven and a half inches tall. Uh, if there is scaffolding, uh, whether it's in any vessel, I would strongly recommend you tell them a foot of clearance because you usually get somewhere in a little bit lower of, above uh, but yeah i mean again it, there's some geometries that are not as great for it uh, but we actually have uh, an ability to do small diameter piping we have robots that are very flexible so the other thing is because we are a robotics company if you have an application that we haven't thought about or i haven't mentioned feel free to reach out i mean that's what we're trying to do is help customers i mean we have a robot that was specifically requested by one of our earliest customers that has since been used by multiple uh, utilities and industries throughout the world. So, well, that, and, and that's a great segue because I, again, a lot of this for me is new. And I, I think I remember seeing Gecko the first time at Dry Scrubber Users back in Philadelphia, if I'm not mistaken, was the first time I saw you guys. And uh, just thinking that this was just such a different, innovative technology that I'd personally never really seen. And so, I guess my question to you, because it sounds like this, you know, there's multiple robots. You know, I'm learning you guys are doing in back house, even piping. Um, how has this been kind of generally like received from the industry? Because, I mean, I think this is just something that just seems kind of new. And I imagine guys that maybe have been in the in this industry for decades that this is a little bit radical. But how has it been received and how has it been evolved? And, you know, where do you guys see it kind of going in the future and how it could continue to be utilized in ways that it hasn't? Yeah, so... When when we started out, we were purely, you know, CFB boilers and, and we saw an opportunity to help customers. And so we switched over to PC boilers and, and, and bag house stuff. Uh, and then we understand that there was other applications. So how it was received at first was, hey, you know, this is a great tool for my boiler. Uh, but my main concern is somewhere outside of the furnace. Uh, and that's, you know, it's cool. I really like it, but I don't really have a need for it. So we take down that information and we go back and approach them. For the longest time, you know, people thought of Gecko as just a boiler. And, and, and now we're talking about all different type of aspect, assets. Piping especially is a big one because of our, our uh, presence in Houston with, with the oil and gas industries. And one, what we're looking to the future is some really cool stuff. I don't know if I'm allowed to, to talk about what we our, our game plan is in five years, but I'll leave it with this. There's a reason why we save all our A scans. Uh, and there's something that we're coming up with that's really good. To, my, my conversations with, with internally are going to be really helpful, not just from an asset reliability standpoint, but from a lifetime uh, predictability standpoint, um, sunsetting, things like this. And a lot of times our customers will use this information to justify replacements, projects uh, down the road, extending, you know, PPAs, things like this. So it's been received. Uh, and as long as we understand expectations from both each other, we can most certainly find a solution that fits everyone's needs.
Okay. Well, Thank MPJ, you. I appreciate you uh, presenting on that. That that's really good presentation. I'm sure, um, our audience uh, learned a thing or two. Um, so appreciate appreciate your time and, and answering questions too, man. Um, so I think just to keep things on on track, Jerry, um, we're gonna uh, do a commercial slide, I believe, and then uh, transition to Primex and Stuart Nicholson. Correct? Yes, sir. Um, so you guys should be seeing my screen here. I see it. Um, Again, big thank you to, uh, thanks MPJ for that. And um, again, I just want to continue to acknowledge our sponsors because um, again, we we can't do it without you guys. Uh, and can you continue to do this evolutionary process of uh, doing these webinars from the in-person conferences? So uh, again, just want to take some time to acknowledge them. Um, I know you guys have heard just heard about Gecko Robotics. So they're one of our sponsors uh, carried over from last year. Um, Dave Kahn from Gecko has been someone that's been instrumental in Drive Scrubber users for years and years. He was a member of the board. Um, he still continues to stay actively engaged with DSUA and has been an avid supporter. So, and again, uh, Sam and everyone at Gecko that helped us work through this platform. So, uh, I think you guys have heard a lot about them. And if you need to get in touch with them and want to find out more information, here's uh, some direct contact information or feel free to reach out to DSUA. But a big thank you to Gecko for. Um, you know, being supportive of DSUA and staying actively engaged in the industry. Uh, we got a new sponsor this year, Redicam. Um, they are an equipment supplier that they provide an extended range of flu gas treatment, air pollution control equipment throughout many industries, uh, very relevant to dry scrubbing applications, whether it's DSI or you got a CDS or you're looking at some a DSI with recirculation, these various technologies are all relevant. Um, they serve their end users with these multitude of technologies, meeting different uh, emission reduction requirements in cost effective manners. They've got a wealth of experience as they've been doing this for, you know, four decades plus uh, through operational experience. And um, ultimately, they seek to be a reliable partner to their end users, whether it's a greenfield site or simply trying to retrofit one of these solutions. So um, you've got a air pollution control need uh, through the dry scrubber industry, you know, Redicam can be uh, a partner to you. And uh, Salvatore Gallo, um, you can find his contact information. Salvatore is uh, another person much like Mitch that's stepped up and supported the DSUA uh, as an, an advisory role. And again, he's appreciate him volunteering his time to help kind of pull all this together for the industry. So uh, you know, thank you to Redicam for being a sponsor and uh, feel free to come check him out. Uh, National Filter Media, NFM, has been, a, again, they were a sponsor for us last year as well. And um, they're known, they, they take pride as one of the world's oldest and large, largest providers of air pollution control and uh, liquid filtration products. So they've got successes that adhere to the same business principle that they developed when they were founded in 1906. So they believe in building partnerships with their customers and, and earning the business on a continued daily basis. So um, while a lot's changed in the industry from a technology perspective, these same principles that they developed in 1906, you know, they still apply and they're still committed to it and look to build long-term solutions and uh, partnerships with these end users. So, um, you know, reach out to, if you want to find out more information, just to chat with them, uh, Keith Ogilvy, his contact information is there. And uh, thank you again to NFM for being a, being a sponsor to DSUA. And last, but not certainly not least, we've got Leckler. Uh, Leckler, again, was a, they were a sponsor last year, <clears throat> and they've come back this year, so we thank them again for continued support. They've got over 140 years designing and manufacturing various spray solutions for air quality control systems. So they got a wide range, whether it's nozzles, nozzle lances, valve stands, and mist eliminators, they can provide a multitude of solutions for gas cooling, purification, denitrification, or desulfurization. Um, they advise they advise customers with custom solutions based on what their needs are to achieve compliance and whatever your stringent emission requirements are. Um, in addition to their equipment, they've got experts that can support you guys that understand these technologies and solutions, and they'll share their expertise to help you guys navigate through your custom problems and develop custom solutions and, and look at similarly as NFM develop, you know, long-term partnerships. So again, these are all of our sponsors. Um, you've heard from most of them, but also want to take time to recognize and acknowledge IGS uh, as well as Alice Carbon. They're both uh, sponsors in addition to the folks you've heard from. And 
Uh, if you guys want to know anything more about any of these sponsors or want to get in touch with them, um, you can come to the Dry Scrubber users website and um, you scroll down on the homepage, you can find all of their logos for the sponsors and you click on it, you can get to their home, you can get to their homepage specifically, or you're always more than welcome to reach out to DSUA and we'll make sure we get you in touch with a representative. Uh, anyone listening to this, if you're interested in wanting to be a sponsor as well, uh, like what you hear and want to you know, have further support, uh, also reach out to us. You know, we're, we're continuously taking sponsorship and um, any, anything we can do, any questions, you know, feel free to reach out to us. So uh, that's the last of the sponsorship commercials. Again, big thank you to you guys. Um, instrumental in making DSUA successful throughout this evolution through the whole COVID process. So uh, having said that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Mitch, so we can start with our next presentation. I no, appreciate that, Jerry. We can't do much without our sponsors. So obviously they're very important to us. Um, so our next presenters are going to be Stuart Nicholson and Stephen Cornelly with uh, uh, Primex Process Specialists. Um, they have some really interesting content on uh, SDA monitoring and detection. But before we get into the really interesting stuff, I wanna, I wanna talk these guys up a little bit. Um, so Primex, who's Primex? Primex is a professional services firm uh, that specializes in providing dry scrubber users with uh, performance optimization solutions. They are also uh, based in PA, much like Gecko, but other side of the state, uh, um, close to the Philadelphia area. Um, so Stuart's going to be our primary presenter with Stephen as, as support, answering questions and all that good stuff. Um, so a little bit about these two guys, uh, Stuart, um, is a professional engineer with a, a degree in mechanical engineering from the university of British Columbia. Stuart, I don't know whose mascot university of British Columbia is. I'm sorry about that, but, uh, <laughs> um, something Stuart, to do with hockey. What is it? Something to do with hockey. <laughs> uh, so Stuart's also an ASME published author. He's also the former president of the DSUA. So um, I don't know if there's any competition there, but uh, Jerry, Jerry, <laughs> Jerry and Stuart are our, our, our current and former presidents. Um, Stuart's also an entrepreneur, uh, having founded Primex in 2001 and uh, serves as its company's president. So uh, kudos to you, uh, Stuart. Got an appreciation there for being the entrepreneurial spirit you are. Um, also, Stephen Cornelly, I mentioned, he's a chemical engineer. Uh, from Drexel University, go Dragons, I believe. Um, Steven is a performance engineer with Primex that uh, evaluates and optimizes uh, flue gas treatment systems for primarily power, uh, power generating end users. Um, so having said that, the floor is yours, gentlemen, and my leading question for you is, can you tell us if there is a better way to detect nozzle malfunction in spray dry absorbers? Well, th thanks, Mitch. Uh, yes, I can. And um, I hope I can deliver that uh, over the next uh, 20, 30 minutes. Um, I would like to, uh, in addition to thanking you, Mitch, uh, also thanks to uh, Jerry, Sam, Travis, the rest of the team that uh, brought this webinar together today. You guys have done an outstanding job. And just in general to the Dry Scrubber Users Association for you know, uh, pulling these webinars together this year. Um, in difficult circumstances. Uh, I, I, maybe our audience already knows, but the Dry Scrubber Users Association is a nonprofit organization. All of the folks that contribute, the board is a completely volunteer basis. Uh, so people are kind of doing this in their spare time um, for the good of the industry. So I really, really appreciate what you folks do for us and uh, giving Primex the opportunity to, uh, to, present, uh, to present our material today. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share my screen here. Hopefully this works out. Success. All right. So uh, the title is Slurry Atomization Anomaly Detection in Spray Dryer Absorbers. Um, I am going to talk today particularly about dual fluid nozzle systems. Um, so in the semi-dry spray dryer absorber process, we're spraying a combination of lime slurry or reagent uh, and water and perhaps recycle slurry into the flue gas stream. Um, in most cases in the power industry that is achieved through rotary atomizers. 
Um, however, in a number of cases, it's also in a dual fluid nozzle system, and I will explain that a uh, little bit more detail in a few moments. Uh, just as an aside, the waste energy industry uses the dual fluid nozzle atomization process very extensively, much more commonly, in fact, than uh, the uh, rotary atomizer technology. So really, this story today is a, is a case study. Um, it's about how one end user discovered that uh, anomalies or obstructions of the dual of the nozzles themselves were interfering uh, with the atomization efficiency, which was causing uh, material, excessive material accumulation in the absorber vessels, which was leading to massive quantities of material accumulating in the absorber vessels, um, a tremendous amount of manpower needed to deal with that accumulation involving safety hazards, uh, obviously reliability of their system was being affected. And uh, over time, it was also discovered that the same symptoms were involved in um, reducing the efficiency of the dry scrubber system. So safety, reliability, efficiency are uh, related to this story. Um, so I'm just gonna go ahead and jump right into the, uh, to the rest of it. Uh, just wanted to, before I jump in again, please, uh, for the audience that is listening remotely, um, uh, feel free to uh, ask questions using the uh, Q&A feature. Um, we will be looking at those questions as, as they come in, and um, I'd love to be able to answer them as they arise, if possible. Um, some may need to be pushed to the end, but uh, please uh, go ahead and, and pop your questions up as they occur to you, and we'll uh, try and field them as soon as we can. Um, okay, so this is just a, an overview of the particular system that we're going to talk about. Uh, this uh, facility is equipped with uh, two generating units. Uh, each generating unit is equipped with a dual vessel absorber configured as we're showing here. The uh, two spray dry, excuse me, spray dry absorbers. Let's see if I can get my little laser pen point going here. Uh, so yeah, two spray dryer absorbers. Each spray dryer absorber is equipped with a dedicated pulse jet fabric filter. Um, on the reagent preparation side of the system, there's a lime silo with a lime slaking equipment. So we're preparing a calcium hydroxide or lime slurry reagent for SO2 removal. In addition, this unit is equipped with a fly ash recycle system. So uh, bag house fly ash is actually recirculated back into the waste ash recycle bin mixed with water and then pumped up to be recirculated back through the uh, absorber vessels. Uh, lime slurry is injected at this unit into the pump suction of the transfer pumps from the recycle system. So we're adding fresh reagent into that recycle slurry flow. It is pumped up to the uh, penthouse areas where a secondary pump delivers it uh, into the nozzle array. Um, so uh, again, this is dual fluid nozzle. The two fluids are the slurry itself and compressed air. Compressed air is used to atomize the slurry through the nozzle assemblies. So what, what's the real problem here? The, the problem, as I said, in this particular facility, um, shortly after startup, um, they began to experience large quantities of material accumulating in the SDA hopper vessel. So right down in this area of the system, lots and lots of material accumulating, also some accumulation in the outlet duct. Uh, but the main issue was plugage of the material. Um, in this particular system, uh, ash is actually continuously collected out of the bottom of the SDA vessels. Some of it is recirculated back into the recycle mix tanks. Uh, but they had uh, continuous plugage incidences into the, in the bottom of the SDA vessels. Uh, this is some of the, the pictures of the consequences of that. This is a relatively mild, uh, mild instance. They had, in some cases, the ash was piled all the way up almost 14 feet to the bottom of the SDA vessel hopper outlet. Um, and this was happening uh, in the first five, six years, in fact, after startup. Uh, at a very high frequency, we're talking four or five times a week. Uh, they had to take people in there. The, the cleaning the plug ups was a major uh, effort involving a lot of people, uh, equipment to 
bail that material out to get it uh, safely disposed of. Uh, there were a number of safety issues that occurred uh, over those years with near misses and uh, even some uh, recordable uh, accidents related to the process of cleaning this material out, getting, uh, you know, getting close to the equipment and so forth. So it was a really a major, major issue it was not expected at all when the systems were initially commissioned. Um, so that's the, the main issue that uh, this particular client needed to solve. So let's just take a step back for a minute uh, and just talk about the sort of the roadmap. Um, what we're referring to today is uh, the material accumulation. This is uh, our way of thinking about the, what we call the controllable factors that affect dry scrubber performance. Um, the three things that we're interested in changing typically would be material accumulation, corrosion remediation, um, and in, uh, in Michael Paul Jenkins' uh, presentation earlier in this webinar, he talked a lot about the corrosion issues. And of course, uh, lime consumption or reagent consumption, uh, one of the most significant operating costs at uh, most of these facilities. So, so this is our sort of uh, view of the world, the things that we can actually change that might affect performance. So we're gonna talk today just about the material accumulation and specifically about atomization and dispersion. Um, as it pertains to the dual fluid nozzle system. So going back to our picture here, we wanna talk about these, uh, the nozzle system and I'm gonna just kind of zero in a little bit into the configuration. So if we look down from above uh, these two absorber vessels, they're configured uh, with 20 nozzles in each of the absorber vessels and they're arrayed in these sort of concentric rings. Um, each of the nozzles looks like this. Actually, these, uh, these are Leckler nozzles for, for the, for, to recognize one of our other co-sponsors. Um, so the Leckler nozzles are configured with uh, wear-resistant internal liners. And of course, the, uh, the, uh, both the two fluids, the compressed air and the slurry, come together in these nozzles to create the, uh, a finely atomized slurry droplet. A little bit more configuration. Um, so the way the slurry and air distribution systems are set up in each absorber vessel, there's a, a ring header that supplies the compressed air. Um, and at each branch, uh, at each of the 20 branches feeding the individual nozzles, the airflow is controlled. It's both measured and controlled. So there's an airflow transmitter and an airflow control valve. The distributed control systems automatically maintain the valve position as required to achieve the desired airflow rate through the nozzles. The airflow rates are prescribed by the nozzle manufacturer as required to efficiently atomize the slurry. The slurry supply itself is through a separate ring header. Again, each, each uh, of the nozzles has its, an individual branch, um, but the, the flow to these nozzles is not independently controlled. Basically, there's a variable speed pump that pressurizes or increases or decreases the pressure inside this ring header. Uh, and then the flow goes, well, hopefully equally to all 20 nozzles or all the nozzles that happen to be in service at that particular time. So that's the basic configuration. Um, now, what about the actual problem? So going back, I think to this, the operations personnel at the facility began to notice that the, the, when a nozzle was misbehaving, a, a, a nozzle obstruction was often indicated in the flow control valve position. So if slurry was building up in that nozzle, remember, you know, these nozzles are immersed in uh, 300 degree flue gas. They're at the hot end of the absorber vessel. So the heat and the flow uh, variations in flow rates, variations in air pressures and flows sometimes can cause material to accumulate in the, in the bore of those nozzles or in the throat section of the nozzles. And over time that slurry dries and it builds up and it begins to block the nozzle or interfere with the uh, atomization of the slurry into the, into the gas stream. So the operations personnel basically said, hey, you know, we're beginning to see that we can detect that just by observing that when this nozzle goes 100% open, we're pretty sure that the nozzle, excuse me, when the flow control valve goes 100% open, uh, we are pretty sure that the nozzle itself is obstructed. So with that bit of information, um, a much deeper analysis 
revealed a couple of very interesting facts. And this is a trend that shows the airflow control valve position of two of the 20 nozzles in one of the absorber vessels. So this is a eight day time frame. Uh, again, this is nozzle position and excuse me, uh, airflow control valve position uh, in percent. And what you can see here is the nozzle slowly opening up. So this is sort of normal performance. The, the uh, airflow control valve position in that 50 to 60 range. Um, and then uh, you can see the airflow control valve opening up, opening up further and further, and then hitting 100% open. So this would be the point at which the operations personnel would realize that there was a, an obstructed nozzle. Um, at that point, they would take the nozzle out of service, swap it for a clean one, and then put the system back into service. And then uh, we basically resume normal operation with the airflow control valve position down in the you know, 40, 50 range. Um, uh, so, so what does this really tell us? It tells us that the nozzle itself is obstructed. The, the uh, obstruction is indicated in the airflow control valve position going to 100%. But when, when, when we looked at this, we, we, we could see this trend beginning to appear long before the actual obstruction reached the point at which the nozzle needed to open to 100%. So we did a little bit of statistical analysis on this data. And what we discovered is that if the nozzle itself, excuse me, if the airflow control valve uh, opened up above 62%, then there was more than a 90% probability that the, the, the nozzle would, uh, would pl be plugging somewhere within a couple of hours to a couple of days after the airflow control valve position opened up to 62%. So the indication, the, 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 I'd say the early warning system that was developed was the recognition that when that airflow control valve exceeded 62%, the atomization was not necessarily affected at that point, but it was pointing to an impending uh, nozzle malfunction or obstruction that would be coming at some point later. So in this example, the, uh, the, the, the first moment at which the 62% uh, airflow control valve position was, was, was reached. 24 hours later, the nozzle was blocked and the airflow went, valve went to 100%. Uh, in the second example, it was actually much longer, but there was an initial uh, indication of 62% at this point, and then it was 60 hours later that the, uh, the, the airflow valve went to 100%, indicating that the nozzle was fully blocked. So what, what happened here is we implemented an automatic system and we set it up so that in the control room, if a nozzle, if an airflow control valve position reached 62%, essentially that nozzle was alarmed in the control room to indicate to the operators that the nozzle itself, that there was a, 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 an impending failure or obstruction of that nozzle and they could then take immediate action. So uh, that's how things uh, changed as, as far as the actual anomaly detection is concerned. And then of course, there was some training and some uh, encouragement needed uh, to um, persuade the O&M personnel, first of all, to trust this indication and then to begin to take action based on it. Uh, in addition, uh, this is on top of a weekly uh, a preventive maintenance program in which all of the nozzles would be changed out, not all at once, but in, in sequences, um, and cleaned and changed out on a weekly uh, PM schedule. So this was the uh, basic anomaly detection strategy, early warning, early detection before the nozzle became fully plugged. Um, so that was the improvement in the atomization and dispersion component. We'll, we'll circle back to that a little bit in a moment. There were two other things that were going on concurrently. One of them was uh, an increase in, in a change in the fly ash recycle density. Again, this is another one of the controllable factors that points to material accumulation. Um, so during the course of the program in which the nozzle anomalies were being, uh, we, were, uh, we were learning how to detect those anomalies. Uh, the plant was also taking uh, steps to raise their recycle density Again, a higher density is very beneficial for the drying efficiency in dry scrubbers. Um, and the other change that was made was to Im implement uh, automatic and continuous uh, measurement uh, and control of the approach to saturation temperature. Uh, we won't go into that too much deeply, but I just wanted to point out that in addition to the nozzle anomaly detection, there were a couple of other things that were going on in parallel with, with that program. 
all of them, of course, pointing to material accumulation. In other words, the plant personnel, the senior management of the plant said, we need to do everything we can think of to try and reduce this material accumulation in our absorber vessels. So really all three of these boxes were tackled in parallel. All right, let's talk about some of the um, other uh, aspects of that uh, process. The, uh, I, I mentioned approach temperature control a minute ago. So uh, another change that was made was to understand that the approach temperature, which governs the, the flow of slurry in through these nozzles, it needed to be uh, changed based on the actual recycle slurry density. So one of the other improvements was to understand that if for whatever reason, uh, the recycle density changed and particularly if, if it reduced. So if there was a problem getting ash into the recycle makeup system, and that slurry density began to drop off, uh, the plant personnel were uh, directed to, re to raise the approach temperature set point to maintain an efficient drying rate in the absorber vessel. So this, what we call the drying curve, uh, is now set up in the control room. It, it helps the operators determine or to decide when and how to change their approach temperature set point if they lose their recycle slurry density. Okay, so to summarize, um, before these changes were made in the past, uh, they did do the weekly preventive maintenance on all the nozzles. Um, in, initially, their recycle slurry density set point was 27% and approach temperature was uncontrolled. Um, at the present time, they are continuing with their weekly nozzle preventive maintenance program. Um, they, we've now instituted the condition-based maintenance of the nozzles. So whenever that 62% alarm is indicated, uh, the, the team is, is uh, reacting immediately either to cycle the valve to try and clean out the nozzle or to actually go up there and replace it when, when that occurs. Uh, the recycle density set point has gradually been increased. They're currently operating at 36%. And as I mentioned, they are now controlling and managing their approach temperature based on the uh, drying curve. Okay. Let's talk about results. This is a chart that shows the plug up, what they call the, uh, S, the vessel, the absorber vessel plug up frequency. So this is the number of absorber vessel plug up events uh, over time. Um, 2018, uh, just to put this in perspective, we didn't even put 2017 on here, but basically from 2017 all the way back to the startup of the units in 2011, 2012, the plug up, plug up frequency had been in the hundreds of years, but, uh, hundreds per year. Uh, and even in 2018, um, there were a, a total of 153 plug up events. Again, each one of these events requiring many uh, man hours of labor, uh, equipment, uh, interference with unit operation, um, risks to you know, hazards to personnel in the, in the management of the, the issues. So 153 in 2018, a uh, dramatic reduction in 2019 down to only 11 uh, and a similar performance uh, last year in 2020. So big benefits here in terms of safety and reliability. The uh, cost saved in uh, just dealing with these uh, plug up events was in the order of hundreds of thousands of dollars per year. Another, um, co I guess, coincident uh, improvement was in overall scrubber efficiency. Um, so the improvement in the in the atomization and dispersion, uh, the improvement in recycle slurry density, the uh, control and management of approach temperature in the absorber vessels, all those things really, I, I think just to kind of go up here one, one uh, slide or two, I wanted to point out that not only do these factors that we're talking about affect material accumulation, they also directly affect lime consumption. Um, so uh, there were in fact some additional benefits in that department as well. This shows the specific lime consumption at this facility. It is the basically the tons of lime consumed per ton of SO2 removed. We want the number to be nice and small. Uh, I've removed the names of the, uh, the individual facilities on, on this chart to protect the guilty. <laughs> uh, but basically uh, at the facility we're talking about uh, over from 2017 to 2019, uh, you know, uh, more than a 30% reduction in lime consumption per 
ton of SO2 removed. So dramatic improvement in overall scrubber efficiency as well. Um, okay, moving on to uh, some lessons learned uh, out of this experience. Um, certainly, uh, you know, nozzle obstruction is not the only factor affecting material accumulation. Um, so, you know, keeping keeping the big picture in focus, uh, looking at these other factors, fly ash recycle approach temperature, were uh, were was an important part of uh, the process. Uh, in addition, some additional work was done and continues to try and identify what other factors may be uh, affecting the plug up events or the frequency of those plug up events. Um, so some more recent analysis has been done to try to correlate the remaining uh, plug up events. Uh, you know, we're still getting 10 to 20 a year, so we'd like that number to be zero. Um, what we discovered is that the correlation is, in every plug up event, is correlated with either an airflow control valve alarm, in other words, an indication of a nozzle obstruction, or a unit startup, or elevated ash moisture in the SDA, uh, in the baghouse and SDA systems. So uh, this, this is a more uh, a deeper dive that's underway now to try and understand what else can be done to reduce the number of plug up incidences. Uh, it's interesting, for example, on uh, SDA 2B and that one absorber vessel, five out of the six plug up events on that one vessel correlated with startup. So uh, startup is a, you know, as they bring these uh, units online and at, at, like many other coal fired units, they are cycling these units now. So a lot more frequent startups and shutdowns and that does correlate uh, at least in this one absorber vessel. So we're continuing to study uh, the, the correlations and uh, see if we can find different ways to uh, reduce the, um, the plug up frequency even further. Hey Stuart, there is one yes, question David? that came in um, from the audience, from Kevin, and he was asking, were the plug ups due to wet material or was it mostly dry? I know you did mention um, elevated ash moisture uh, in some cases, but can you tackle that question? Yes, um, both is the answer. In other words, there were some plug ups in which there were large chunks of what appeared to be uh, uh, mud that had dried or semi dried, you know, large unbreakable chunks of material probably shedding off the absorber wall. Um, uh, there were days when they were getting, they were literally getting slurry running out of the bottom of these absorber vessels, you know, when the nozzles became so badly plugged that there's no atomization at all. You're just basically spraying, you know, 30 or 40 gallons a minute of lime slurry down, in, or sorry, uh, recycle slurry into the bottom of the SDA vessel. Um, there were other days, uh, Kevin, when the material was, was quite dry, but there was just a heck of a lot of it. In other words, it was dry, but it was coarse, and it was too heavy to be carried out through the SDA outlet duct to the bag house. So it just sort of accumulated um, in the bottom of the vessel to the point where, you know, it was plugged. So yeah, a couple of different uh, different mechanisms underway there. Good question, thanks. So let's move on. Uh, some of the other lessons learned: um, personnel availability can be a limiting factor. So you know, all the technology in the world uh, doesn't necessarily solve a problem. At the end of the day, it does come down to people uh, responding to the information that they're being provided with, uh, making good decisions, being available to take a nozzle out of service, being available to notice that it needs to be taken out of service, uh, to be aware of the consequences of not dealing with it promptly. Uh, so, you know, personnel available, availability, I would also say knowledge and training, uh, absolutely critical to, uh, to the success of programs like this. Uh, going back to the nozzle uh, configuration, Again, uh, that particular pattern as they start these units up, they don't start them up with all 20 nozzles in, in each absorber vessel at once. They bring them in gradually starting with eight nozzles. Uh, we're beginning to discover that certain nozzle locations are more inclined to experience these nozzle plug up events than others. Um, and um, of course, you know, preventing the nozzle issue is uh, much more effective than reacting to them. So, you know, moving toward more of a conditioned based maintenance approach, as opposed to a uh, corrective or reactive uh, maintenance approach is uh, I think everybody's uh, uh, intention and goal. 
Stuart, there's another question that came in. Um, do you know if the, the site mapped which nozzles were becoming obstructed? Uh, well, we have, yes, we have noticed, as I said in the previous uh, bullet item, that some nozzle locations present more problems than others, actually. Um, and Stephen, if you want to, you know, go ahead and tackle that one yourself, because <laughs> you're the guy that's been analyzing this. But yeah, you can, I think you can attest that there are some nozzle locations that are definitely more problematic than others. Sure. And we probably, we don't have an exact number on, you know, which, how many or what percentage of obstructions come on certain locations. But just from personal experience, seeing which nozzles become obstructed, it appears that you know as much as you know forty to fifty percent of the obstructions are probably due to the same, say, five nozzle locations. So we are we are seeing um, a certain um, pattern in which nozzles are becoming obstructed more often. All right, let's uh, keep going. Uh, get uh, another 10 minutes left before we're supposed to be done here. So we'll try and uh, move toward the conclusions. Um, again, please keep those questions coming. I'm happy to, to tackle them as they come in. Um, we'll have some time uh, hopefully at the end as well. But uh, uh, okay, so uh, just sort of looking forward into, you know, next steps, uh, future work. Uh, you know, the plant management are very clear they want this problem to be completely eliminated. That is, that is their goal because there's still a significant amount of money even though the, the number of, of plug up events has been reduced by more than 90%, uh, there's still money to be saved and, and you know hazards to, to personnel uh, that can be reduced by eliminating the plug up. So that is the goal. Um, so some of the next steps are to utilize the existing thermocouple chains that uh, there's four chains that hang down inside each of these absorber vessels. And on each of those chains, there are four temperature sensors. Um, so it is possible to actually map the temperature distribution inside the absorber vessel to understand, uh, to understand when a nozzle is, is beginning to plug. So if a nozzle is beginning to plug, you might be able to see that in an imbalance in the temperature. And also to use that to select the nozzles uh, that provide the most even temperature distribution inside the absorber vessel uh, during different uh, phases of operation. So startup, mid load, max load, et cetera. Um, our belief here is that the configuration of the nozzles, that is say the nozzle selection uh, is a critical factor in balancing the temperature and improving the drying efficiency and the overall efficiency uh, in the absorber vessel. So the the thermocouple chains are uh, on the table right now for a deeper examination to see if uh, we can uh, use that to detect other anomalies or optimize performance. Um, continuing efforts to increase the recycle slurry density. You know, it's a very simple tactic. Uh, by the way, I would say this, you know, this roadmap is applicable not only to the dual fluid nozzle dry scrubber users out there, but also anybody that's operating the rotary atomizers. Uh, some of it are, is also applicable to DSI and CDS applications as well. But uh, for those of you who are operating either the rotary atomizers or the dual fluid nozzles, uh, raising recycle density is a very simple way to improve drying efficiency and improve uh, overall chemical efficiency inside the dry scrubbers. Um, so continuing efforts to get the recycle density above 36%, it's currently limited. Uh, due to ash transfer limitations. So uh, there's an initiative underway to see what can be done to uh, remove that bottleneck to get the uh, ash density up another percent, another couple percent, keep pushing it up. All right, so I'm gonna uh, bring it to a close here um, just to conclude. Um, you know, the dry scrubber systems with dual fluid nozzles, the nozzle obstruction and nozzle performance are an absolutely critical issue. It's one of these boxes up here, the atomization element, which affects both lime consumption and material accumulation. Um, a major, major component of the overall scrubber performance. Um, again, I would add that those of you who are operating rotary atomizers need to, to be uh, aware of the condition of those nozzles uh, in the rotary atomizers as well. 
Uh, so it's applicable to both. Um, major effects on safety. Um, again, this particular client did have some issues around safety directly related to the personnel um, who were involved in the cleaning out of those plug up events. Uh, and of course, you know, uh, unit reliability and operating cost, uh, very, very substantial. We're talking, as I said, many hundreds of thousands of dollars just in the plug up events alone. Uh, and a lot of additional savings realized in the improvement in lime consumption. Um, the, uh, the key takeaway from this is that the nozzle airflow control valve position was, was found uh, to be a reliable, very reliable predictor, an early warning predictor of nozzle obstruction. And that was a kind of a breakthrough to be able to quantify the specific moment at which the, the prediction can be made reliably. Um, and that really was kind of a game changer for this facility in terms of being able to replace those nozzles before they became obstructed to the point at which the atomization was uh, really compromised. Um, and then, um, you know, the, de the detection was not, nozzle obstruction detection wasn't the only factor that uh, made the change here. The slurry density, as I said, approach temperature control and management, um, giving us that fantastic reduction in plug up frequency uh, down by more than 90%. Um, so, and then finally, uh, as I said, there's uh, steps underway and uh, we're hoping that we can uh, work with this client uh, to help uh, completely eliminate plug up events in the future. And I, I'm pretty sure that uh, if that is achieved, we will see additional benefits uh, even on the lime consumption side as well. So uh, we're looking forward to uh, continuing this story uh, maybe next year. So that is, uh, that is my story. Uh, I am sticking to it. Uh, we're at the uh, 31 minute mark. So I think uh, Mitch and Jerry, I think we've got a few more minutes here for, for, uh, for questions if we want to yeah. tackle some of those. Yeah, I think um, Stephen, I think uh, you've uh, co uh, collat or consolidated some of those questions. I think we're gonna uh, wrap up uh, around 11.35. So let's just tackle as many questions as we can get. Sure. Yeah, so um, another question that came in is if you could go into a little bit more detail, Stuart, on how we landed at 62% for the nozzle alarm. Well, it was a, it was a statistical analysis and uh, Stephen, you were in, directly involved in it. So basically we looked at the, the frequency of the 100% nozzle flow conditions occurring within a specified time period after the 62%. So it was a statistical analysis that allowed us to understand that it was the 62% mark that was more than 90% likely to result in a subsequent full, fully open condition indicating nozzle plugage. So it was sort of a, an analytical process uh, using statistics to identify that magic number. Right. So I assume, Stuart, that with this philosophy, uh, if you went to kind of recapture this at a different site, uh, determining that percentage is custom based on that statistical analysis you guys would do. You might not necessarily land on 62% someplace else. It's all based on that analysis you did. Exactly. Yeah, it's very, very specific to each facility. Makes sense. Okay, thank you. Okay, another one that came in here. Um, when we were looking at the specific lime consumption comparisons at the plant. Yes. Were, were they operating under the same SO2 removal during those different years? No. Oh, oh it was the, this plant was, yes. The, yes. This particular plant was, was operating under the same SO2 removal, certainly for 17, 18, and 19. Uh, in 2020, they did in fact decrease their SO2 emissions um, so they reduced their pound per mm BTU set points at the stack. So there was a little bit more scrubbing going on in 2020 than there was compared to the previous years. Uh, but, you know, 17, 18, 19 are directly comparable. Okay, great. Uh, I would like to point out, though, that the rest of the, of the facilities on this chart are all scrubbing to different permit limits uh, with different fuel sulfurs and different load profiles and so forth. So we, we need to take this comparison with a little bit of a grain of salt, um, even though it's, you know, it is a specific lime consumption. Efficiency does change based on some of those other parameters. Yeah. The takeaway I get from this, Stuart, as you guys pointed out, the, the, the site specific at the same removal showing those stoichiometric ratios decreasing as a representation of improved utilization and even more so, like you pointed out, 
from 2019 to 2020, you're not only getting a comparable utilization, but you're also scrubbing at a, a comparable NSR, but you're scrubbing to a higher efficiency, which represents even further improvement in utilization. So it's- Right, right. And I'd like to say that the, the reduction, the improvement in scrubber efficiency shown here, in addition to the reduction in the plug up events uh, is valued at this facility in the order of millions of dollars per year. Appreciate you clar clarifying that, Stuart. I think, um, the, Stephen, do you have any more questions? Maybe we can do one more and then we should go to wrap up. I think we actually covered them all. Excellent. Perfect timing then. Um, Jerry, El Presidente, do you want to take us over the finish line? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, and first, I, I just want to, again, a big thank you to our presenters, um, Stuart and MPJ. Uh, obviously, uh, you can't get an audience to come around without good content. And I think there was a lot of really good stuff that you guys presented and shared with us today. So I certainly appreciate you guys taking the time and effort to all the stuff behind the scenes to prepare for this and then to prepare this stuff. So, you know, I, I think a lot of good stuff. So thank you for that. Um, also, uh, as well as you, Stephen, um, and a thank you to our moderator, Mitch. Uh, you did fabulous. So I uh, appreciate it. Um, again, I want to thank uh, the, all the board members. A lot of people were instrumental and in little pieces kind of pulling all the details together. So uh, again, big thank you to all our board members. And um, again, you can find all of our board members on the website. Um, as Stuart said, these guys are all, everyone's volunteering their time. So we appreciate all the efforts to do that. Uh, again, a thank you to our sponsors and uh, specifically kind of a call to Gecko. They, they definitely went above and beyond to help coordinate um, the, working through this platform and working with DSUA. So uh, Sam, thank you again, specifically to you. You gave us a lot of support. So uh, for everyone else that's still on here, I see we've had pretty steady around 30 or so people outside of our panelists. Thank you guys for all participating. I couldn't, couldn't do that without you guys and your participation. Thanks for the questions coming in. Um, stay tuned. Follow uh, the DSUA LinkedIn website. Uh, you'll see updates. Uh, we, again, this one is recorded and barring some kind of snafu. Um, we're going to get it up and live on YouTube like we did last year. So um, you want to share this with somebody else, we encourage you to do that. So once it's uploaded, we'll, uh, we'll post it on our LinkedIn website, our LinkedIn page. So please follow that as well as on the DSUA website. So um, if you guys think of any questions or would like to have any offline conversations with any of our presenters or a sponsor, um, a quick pathway is just to reach out through the DSUA website. We'll help connect you guys. you got questions you think of later. Again, don't hesitate to reach out and follow up. So again, thank you guys and stay tuned. And we hope uh, plan to have another webinar coming up for you guys here within the next month or so. So again, thanks to everybody and we'll, we'll see you then. Thanks, Jerry. Thanks, everybody. Have Take a great care, day, everyone. Thank you.